Hey YouTube, I've had a few questions on how to uh, kind of distinguish what certain patches are on World War I American uniforms, so I'll make a video. Um, this is one of my originals, it's a uh, 32nd Division service coat, and it's uh, I got the dog tags with it and everything. And it's pretty cool, make sure you check all the pockets if you get originals, because these were in this pocket right here. Original shades, I don't know how old they are, the one side's broken, but... Yeah, nevertheless, they were in there. So we're going to kind of talk about the insignia and stuff. And, and this one doesn't have all of it, but I can show you and um, give you an accurate representation of kind of what I'm talking about. Um, first of all, these patches are going to be post-armistice, 99.9% post -armistice, .9 of the time. Okay, so these were put on after the armistice was signed and people were kind of doing occupation duty in Germany or wherever they were at. And they kind of wanted to start showing off their unit pride. They got the idea of unit patches from the British during the, the Somme when they different units wore different insignia to kind of distinguish themselves from other units. And so people could identify where everybody was at and such. So anyways, um, on this one you're going to see that on the left shoulder we've got on top the unit patch. Now... A lot of these are going to just look like really old school, unique versions of the modern military patches that you know. Like this modern patch is, is in a rectangle now with an arrow and they're all uniform. Back then there was no standard, you know, um, specifications or regulations on these unit patches because it was a new thing. So these are all going to be handmade or, you know, made in a little shop and they're all going to be unique. A lot of them are just cut out from felt. I'm talking about the arrows themselves, but even other units are cut out from felt. Like the first division was just a big red one, which they got their name from, that a lot of people sewed on, and then they started adding the shield. But the shields are all different shades, and you have the second division that's got the big star with the Indian head, and that's usually a, a rhombus that's behind there, but they're all still unique. So, but this one's the 32nd division, so it's got the red arrow. This is embroidered. A lot of them are cut out from felt, but... It's got a felt background with a kind of a shell shape to it, even though it's from an infantry regiment. And it's his hand sewn on, you can tell. Um, third ID is going to be, or third division is going to be just the square with the blue and white stripes. I've got one that's a pretty nice handmade patch, but there's some that are pretty, pretty, um, you know, un unfancy and pretty simple, basic. Kind of get the camera a little closer to show you what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's what your unit patch is going to be, and that's going to be on the top left shoulder. Okay, now some of these units, like the first army is going to have, like, some of these units will have different units within this patch. Like, uh, some of the guys that were attached to the third army when they were in the 32nd division have a little third army patch thing. So, there's a bunch of that stuff. If you want to go do some research online, there's so much about the American Expeditionary Forces um, unit patches. But this is where they were born is post armistice in 1918 and it's kind of cool to see the original patches and then look at them nowadays because they really haven't changed that much they're just a lot more uniform so we'll move on from the unit patches because that's kind of a cool little thing that you can check out on your own because i can't possibly go through every single unit patch that ever existed in world war one it just take forever so now we're going to move down to what everybody thinks is a private chevron and it's actually not um, after World War I, when all these guys returned home, they had discharged. This is the equivalent of the World War II ruptured duck. So this is an honorable discharge chevron, the red chevron facing up. Where in World War II, a private first class insignia would have been. And nowadays, you know, private. So if there's a red chevron on your, on your service coat, that means that the person chose to sew this on after they were honorably discharged to show that they had served honorably and that they were no longer in. So if they wore this uniform to an event or a reunion or something... You know, that's why they'd have that on there. So, when you see that, it's not a rank. And it doesn't really add a lot of value because it's a pretty common deal. <laughs> What's going to is going to mostly be handmade. Uh, this one's hand sewn and might have been made in a little shop, but nevertheless. Now I'm going to kind of... <sighs> freaking flies. I'll bring the sleeve up a bit and show you on the bottom. I'll show you where this is in, in relation to the... D discharge chevron it's at the bottom sleeve about two and a half inches off the bottom but i'm going to bring this up for the camera so we got a decent angle to talk about it so these are going to be your overseas service chevrons because they're kind of a goldish color and they're not silver 
I'll get to that in a second about why you would be able to tell that. Once again, these are all going to be hand or locally shop made. Uh, this is some weird copper wire looking stuff. Um, you see a million variations of this and no two are alike because they're all handmade or you know made in small shops. Each stripe that's gold was authorized for at least six months of service up to a year in theater like over in France in the combat zone. So this person was there for between 12 and 18 months. Because they don't have three, so they weren't there for 18 months, but they also don't just have one, which means between six months and a year. Now, these are also given uh, two, di two different colors. So if you see a service coat with these different colors, you'll know what they are. If you see these in blue, you're only going to see one in blue. Okay, And that's for people that were there in theater, but by the time they got there, it was almost over. It's like guys that got there in October and in September, October, and November that were there for less than six months, but were still nevertheless overseas. And then the silver ones are going to be the same standards as the gold for every six months, except stateside service during the war. So some of these guys are actually going to be wearing, you know, one silver and two gold if they really got into it. But that's what those mean. The gold ones, they're kind of hard to tell. The silver ones are pretty obvious, I've noticed, because the guys were at home and they had more opportunities to get stuff custom made. Uh, the blue ones are going to be like an infantry blue chevron, and there's always going to be one. Those are really easy to distinguish from, you know, the gold. But the gold I've seen in all ranges from copper to almost like a matte steel color to like bright gold to kind of orange to bronze. But they're all supposed to be, the, the regulation states that it's a gold overseas chevron. Now... Getting off of those, we'll move on to the main part and um, kind of show you. Now, during the war, no insignia is going to be worn on the front right here. No medals, no shooting badges, etc., etc. Um, these are the dog tags. Just kind of wanted to show you because I actually have them. They're about a one and three eighth inch uh, aluminum disc. And they're all hand stamped. This guy changed units or something because he got rid of all the other. The other stamping information kind of show you that a little bit but yeah so those are dog tags those are obviously worn under the tunic or service coat now the collar discs I kind of brought that up in my other video about the uniforms on my reproduction stuff but collar discs this one is kind of a cool thing it's a state disc and it's also a regimental disc so this means it was shortly after World War II or, or I'm sorry shortly after World War I or made at the very end of World War I uh, customly. So you've got the, well the, the backing leads me to believe that it's a post-war thing because it's got the kind of checkered backing. But it's got U.S. Michigan 125th Regiment. So it's actually a post-war disc. I showed you in the other video this side's usually for World War One going to be U.S. U.S. National Guard or NG and then U.S. National Army or NA um, with the script or the block kind of like that. And then this side's going to have the regimental stuff and the company letter. Or just be blank for your branch of service. So this one doesn't have two. It's only got the one, which is kind of strange. Um, the buttons, obviously, are going to be just the standard U.S. Eagle style with the great seal on it. And they're going to be rimmed. They're going to have kind of a horizontal striped background. This is kind of a cool little deal. Um, this is a... A family or a privately purchased dog tag. It's got the same info as it does on here, relatively, except it's uh, it's um, a lot smaller and it's made out of steel and it's actually engraved instead of stamped. So some guys would have had that, some guys wouldn't have. All right, now we're gonna move on to a hypothetical because this guy doesn't have anything on his right shoulder because he was most likely just a private and was not wounded it appears so all right right here like I showed you on my video of my reproduction stuff you're gonna see that they're gonna have rank if they're NCOs or even some PFCs post-war had the circle with their branch of service or whatever like infantry cross rifles well this guy doesn't have any but this is where they would be and that's that's their actual rank not the red private looking thing that's actually the discharge chevron and then down here about two and a half inches up just like on the uh, overseas service stripes you're going to have wound stripes. 
and those are going to be gold. So if they have a chevron on the right sleeve on the bottom, or they have two or three or however many, those are given if they were wounded in direct action with the enemy or they, re they received medical attention after the suspicion or the fact that gas was used. So I've got another tunic that I think I made a video on a while back. It's a, uh, thir another 32nd Division tunic. And it's got two wound chevrons on it, so that's kind of interesting. The person got either wounded or gassed twice. Um, in the 30s, these guys could actually exchange the wound chevron for a purple heart in most cases, so a lot of them would do that. You couldn't wear both, but that's why you'll see a lot of World War I vets later on after World War II. They've got a purple heart on their uniform instead of a wound chevron, but that was all, all subjective to the individual. So... After the armistice was signed, you could also see the guys wearing, like, their, if they were on the Mexican border prior to the, to the uh, going over to France, they would have had, you know, that ribbon, their shooting badge. It was all up to the individual what they wanted to wear. Um, when there's no more action, the guys aren't going to be wearing, you know, their combat stuff. They're going to want to wear, kind of show off their regimental stuff. The, the unit patches were kind of a unit pride thing, and rightfully so, because it's pretty neat. Um, yeah, so if you got any questions, go ahead and ask. It should answer all of them. It's actually not that hard for World War One. It's uh, pretty simple regulations and what they actually wore. So, um, but yeah, if you still have questions, go ahead and ask. And uh, yeah, I'll keep making World War One themed videos. It's kind of my one of my favorite time periods. So appreciate you guys watching. Like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video. Thanks.